OK, so can you hear me? Perfect. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the last panel of this conference. So our first speaker is John Plot, who is Mandel Professor of Humanities at Brandeis University and is also editor of the B-Sides feature in public books. He co-hosts the podcast Recall uh, This Book as well. So his extensive list of publications include Semi-Detached, Aesthetic Experience from Dickens to Keaton, published by Princeton uh, University Press in 2017, and a forthcoming mo uh, monograph entitled My Reading, Ursula Le Guin's Earth Sea, published by Oxford, who is going to, which is going to appear with uh, Oxford University Press. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> Professor Plotz is also um, currently working on another project entitled Laughter is from Mars, Science Fiction as Satire. The title of Professor Plotz's paper is Lems Roberts, Mechanical Satire. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Lorenza, and, and I'm going to try to share my screen here. Sorry, I'm, I'm not very good at Teams, but is that visible to you guys? Good. Yes. OK, thank you. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I have a hard time seeing it myself. Something must be going wrong with me. Sorry, just give me a minute. OK, so you can you can see the um, the slide. OK, terrific. I'm going to just trust that that's working well. So thank you so much. To Heather um, for working me through Teams, and to to Paul, and to all the organizers, and thank you to all the participants today. So, um, yeah, a couple of epigraphs here. Um, uh, are there so Paul Saint Amour from a recent book, Tense Future? Are there situations in which an evidently closed apocalyptic futurity, far from draining our acts of responsibility or cur critical purchase, might be the only condition under which a certain kind of critique might be tendered or a certain kind of kinship imagined. And then Kierkegaard, we literally do not want to be what we are. So uh, I think hope both of those frame the way I want to think about why people turn to science fiction in order to confront aspects of humanness, of animalness, of sentience and cognition, um, and what it means to sort of take an uncanny mirror um, uh, approach to understanding the human from the outside that is the robotic. So the branching stream of thinking machines that has its headwater in RUR's original robots has, I think, been most intensively studied in, at least in print science fiction, in its American tributaries. So sometimes the taxonomy focuses on the golden age shiny machines of Isaac Asimov, whose three laws of robotics continue to shape more than just science fiction. And at other times, the crucial turning seems to be towards the uh, ruminations about man, android, and machine in uh, Philip K. Dick's, for example, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, and the aftermath of that kind of problem of cyborg and human, both in mainstream film and in the furrow that was first plowed by Donna Haraway in her cyborg manifesto. So these um, often very earnest American grandchildren of RUR at times retain some of that satirical force and I in Chopek's work. And I would talk about Chopek mainly as manipian satire. I think that's how he's sort of, that's what he's invested in, um, in part because they, um, are palpably shaped by what Roger Lockhurst has called the kinetic pulp heritage of American adventure based science fiction. However, I think that such work uh, within science fiction itself, actually, that not so much the Haraway, sets the limits of the robot human interface surprisingly narrowly. As a rule, the exploration begins by positing what a future interplay between intelligent machines and humans will look like. Um, either uh, by extending ethnographic or sociological theories based on interactions between humans, so taking the robot as a paradigm for some aspect of what's already seen as like present within human-human differential uh, interaction, or as in Haraway's work, by extrapolating out from present day affordances of available technology to ask, you know, how much we're already mechanicalized ourselves by our um, cyborgness. 
So this paper, uh, Lems Robots, which is now called Lems Robots, Humanity Against Itself, is drawn from a monograph in, um, pre uh, in progress that Lorenzo mentioned, uh, Laughter is from Mars, which is about the satirical side of science fiction. So the larger work argues that science fiction, and I, I would just say quickly, I link the genre's takeoff moment, um, circa 1900, to the concurrent rise of naturalism and adult prose fantasy, takes advantage of satire and comedy's distinctive capacity to tweak and perturb, perturb the world's givens enough to usher a new set of possibilities in, into view. So in other words, science fiction is always about either a dark or a comic satirical uh, differentiation of what could be from what actually is. So today I want to explore, uh, I think, a very un-American line of thought pursued by the brilliant Polish science fiction writer Stanislaw Lem um, with satirical glee, notably in his robot stories and his Siberiad, and also going forward to its chilling logical conclusion in works like uh, Golem 14 and the Futurological Congress. Um, and I, I want to do this because I think we're the American branch of the post RUR legacy of robot stories falls short, at least compared to Lim, is in seeing in what follows if the existence of robots reveals to humans an underlying mechanical quality in our own makeup. Neither the robots are ours, nor we are feeble ancestors and foes to the robots, but simply we are the robots. So Lem explores humans impersonating robots, robots who've forgotten that they were once human, humans who deny they were once robots, and a variety of other conceptual variants. Um, he really goes in every possible way around the robot-human interaction. So in some ways, Lem certainly traces his thoughts back to Frankenstein's creature, the paradigmatic Lockean blank slate who has to find out what humanity truly consists of by mechanically assembling what is often presumed to come naturally to humans courtesy of um, presumptively inborn attributes that require no new no inscription or no programming but in other ways i think lem is actually hearkening back to a basic insight of rur that once you get a being of human like once a, a human like machine has been brought into being. Questions of fundamental likeness and difference between the two categories, between what is the robot and what is the human, not only can be asked, but has to be asked, but have to be asked in every possible way, sparking what um, Borges calls in a different conte context, um, the bo Baroque elaboration of the form. Um, and I think if we're tempted to suggest that you could simply cut the Gordian knot, between humanity and machine and declare that if the two are being put side by side, then there really is no difference between them. I think we should be mindful of um, John Stuart Mill's remark about this topic, where, where one feels a difference, a difference there must be. All other appearances may be fallacious, but the appearance of a difference is a real difference. So the problem is that the robot and the human are both seen as possible analogs or homologs and also seen as distinct. And that's what the Baroque elaboration of the form comes out of. So almost every possible relation between two sentient and self-propelled sets of beings Baroquely unfold. Um, where does that lead us? So before arriving at the two texts that I go on um, in a longer version to study most intensely, that is um, Futurological Congress and Golem 14, I wanted to unpack a few earlier instances of uh, Lem playing with one of the most straightforward relations, robots who come across as simply a form of human. So as Richard Ziegfeld puts it in his 1985 st study, Status Law Lem, the most shocking and far reaching implication in, Zem in Lem's approach to cybernetics is his insistence that the ma man not treat the machine as a thing. I think there's a lot more to be added to that problematic of man not treating machine as thing, and that might involve sketching Lem's relationship to Norbert Wiener and to the cybernetic uh, revolution as a whole, 
which is generally not taken as crucial to golden age science fiction, but I think maybe perhaps ought to be. I'm thinking here, for example, of this strange uh, novel from the 1950s, Bernard Wolf's Limbo, which Catherine Hales, who is a sort of descendant of Donna Haraway, has recently championed as a, as a way to understand uh, the, the logic of the cybernetic. Um, but the main point for Lem, virtually throughout his oeuvre, is that we begin to make sense of robots and stories simply by treating them as a mirror to humanity. Held up at a distance, that mirror simply tells tales that we recognize as human tales, torqued and played with. And so these are the sort of 11 fables for robots that Lem is probably best known for. Up close, it forces us, more like a confused bird staring at our own reflection, to goggle and misrecognize, um, or to react in shock and denial, or even to strike out. So I'm thinking especially here of the 11 fables for robots, which appear in the 1972 third edition of Siberiad. And I'm just gonna summarize quickly what I'm interested in here and probably not go into the text as much as I would love to in a, a longer version. Um, so starting with a tale like the three Electra Knights, which is a simple medieval tale, except with robot knights, uh, and then ranging to, uh, to, for example, the White Death, which is a, basically a rewrite of the mask of the Red Death reworked so that on a robot only planet, a human rocket is able to wreak vengeance on robots by bringing mold spores to the to the planet, which freeze the robots. So just as in the in the Red Death, the plague comes and kills everybody. So in the White Death, humans manage to send mold into the robot planet um, so as to shut down all of its gears. So these Lem stories are frequently just one or two steps above the silly. By this I mean that while they're not quite what Robert Scholes once uh, memorably called Star Drek, they do draw their appeal with their bad puns and their cheesy comparisons between metal and fleshy existence and their Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy style from that kinetic pulp heritage of science fiction. In fact, I think proudly lowly is not a bad way to think about both Lem and also Chapek himself, who has the same sort of goofy humor of burlesquing uh, a genre that's already somewhat discreditable. Um, for Chopak, that would be more H.G. Wells, whereas Lem has a whole world of uh, English language science fiction to draw on. Um, and it, that pertains as well to the story I want to spend a little bit more time with, the 11th voyage of Eon of Tichy from the Star Diaries, in which the all-too-human everyman arrives at a robot planet and decides that his only way to survive is to impersonate a robot, only to discover that all of the so-called robots are actually humans impersonating robots. So in other words, on the planet of robots, it's actually humans all the way down. Uh, I wanna spare you the very um, Mark Twain-like plot twists in Lem's story. Um, for example, everybody speaks in a uh, medieval vocabulary because of how the original guiding computer was originally programmed, um, in, including Ijan being unmasked as a fake robot, his discovery that his jailer and his judge are, are also fake robots, and even the discovery that behind the screen at the inner sanctum of the imperial great computer itself uh, you could think the scene at the Wizard of Oz. There's just a tired little bureaucrat who was sent out here to stir up trouble as a way of ensuring continued funding for a future NASA. So basically it's all a scam just to ensure a budget stream to the uh, human space explorers. So not only, in other words, in, in Lem's account, not only are robots no different from humans once you uncover their motivations, um, that's the heart of fables for robots, there may not even be any robots at all. In the Futurological Congress, the next Baroque variation of that mimicry presents itself. Human beings not only impersonate robots, they also forget that they have done so. So at the end of that long, very um, sort of drug trippy novel, um, it was easy to tell from their manners, ultimately, who thought himself a human and who thought himself a robot, but at least the narrator from the present can still shake off the feverish effects of the future to remind himself that, quote, the robots too were only a fiction. So as a way of grasping the cyborg age, 
Um, I think it's worth noting how different this is from what Roger Luckhurst has rightly labeled Philip K. Dick's signal contribution, very contemporary to Lem's, to reactions to the technological age in American science fiction. He talks about the paranoid tone. Despite all the levels of secrecy and humans below robots or robots below humans, Lem's satirical takeaway is actually anti-paranoid. All of this is not worth freaking out a bit because what seems like a great departure in the high-tech age is anything but. So essentially it's robot c'est moi. So I think it's worth pausing here with this idea that human future humans may so persuasively go be, begin to act as robots that they fool even themselves. Looking back even beyond 1922 and RUR, I think this notion of robotic human, humanity, though not under that exact name, can be traced back to the 12th, 19th century in a couple of interesting ways. First, via Marx, with the notion that things are in the saddle and ride mankind. So that's a genealogy of commodity fetishism and a sort of secret life of things that leads all the way to today's object-oriented ontologies in ways that uh, I bet are sort of familiar to everyone here. But I think the second link back to 19th century pre-robotic thinking is maybe even more intriguing. As Lem's highly regarded translator Michael Kandel has noted, there's an affinity between Lem and the dyspeptic dyspeptic narrator of Dostoevsky's Notes from Underground, who long before robots were a technological fact, already envisions that mechanical humans will be paradigmatic either of what humanity itself is or what it could become. So this is a quote from Notes from Underground. Science will teach man that he has never really had any caprice or will of his own, and that he himself is in the nature of a piano key or the stop of an organ. And there are, besides, things called laws of nature, so that everything he does is not done by willing it, but is done of itself by the laws of nature. Consequently, we have only to discover these laws of nature, and man will no longer have to answer for his actions, and life will be exceedingly easy for him. All these human actions will then, of course, be tabulated according to these laws, mathematically, like tables of lo logarithms up to 108,000 and entered in an index, or better still, there will be published certain well-intentioned works in the nature of encyclopedic dictionaries in which everything will be so clearly calculated and noted there will be no more deeds or adventures in the world. So there's a lot to be said about Dostoevsky's vision of anti-mechanistic humanism here, but I think one point worth noting, and this is something I kind of try to go into more when I look at Lem's text more closely, um, is that this notion of what it means for a person to be capable of, quote, deeds and adventures in the world. And the, the reason I think that that sort of medieval phrase is worth noting is that these are just the kind of medieval chivalric accomplishments that Lem's robots in his fables for robots are perpetually undertaking. So in other words, Lem's robots may not be human, but in their faux medievalism, they're surely people. Like you need to look back to the medieval to instantiate the concept of the deed or adventure. So finally, there's another Lem contemporary who has a similar line of thought, which I think also probably has a lineage back to Dostoevsky that's worth unpacking. And I'm thinking here of Hannah Arendt, whose 1958, The Human Condition, makes a distinction between what she calls behavior which is mindless robotic obedience to the pre-programmed laws of the universe, an action which is purposive and comes out of thinking for oneself or what she elsewhere calls thinking without banisters. So the curious twist is that Hannah Arendt says that human beings by their nature act. However, if they come to believe that they're incapable of action by focusing on the physical or biological or cultural laws that underpin their existence, they may mysteriously lose their capacity to act and begin to merely behave. So I think that's the reason that Hannah Pitkin's account of action in Hannah Arendt is called the attack of the blob or the return of the blob. And Pitkin actually makes an explicit uh, uh, connection to 1950s science fiction that um, Arendt would have been reading and thinking about. Um, so in other words, 
mankind is born free, but everywhere thinks itself, sorry, humanity is born free, but everywhere thinks itself into chains. So Lem's account of robots as legendary medieval chivalric knights capable of performing adventures and deeds, um, as against his portrait of humans impersonating robots or even impersonating robots and then forgetting that all they're doing is impersonating robots, I think resembles the Arendtian line of thought here. So Lem's Baroque amplification, so that's Baroque in the Borges sense of the formal exhaustion of all possibilities of combination and recombination, accomplishes, I think, three things. So the first thing it accomplishes is it suggests that if we successfully imagine robot consciousness or sentience at all, such that humans could coexist with robots, then we have to attribute to them agency akin to our own. It's not yet clear in Lem what that kinship means exactly. Whether to be knowable, knowable at all, they must be kind of a tarnished mirror of ourselves, or whether we simply see in them all, it, we see them, sorry, in their difference, wrapped through a lens of our own making. So in other words, is Lem saying that they must ultimately be like us in order to be in the same category as us? Or is he saying we have a problem with confronting the fact that they may be in the same category as us and yet profoundly different from us? So it's it's unclear. Like that's the problem of the tarnished mirror. Um, it's a crucial question, but it's not one that can be easily answered. So the second thing he accomplishes, I think, is that he proposes there are things that humans can do knowingly or unconsciously taking robots as our model that involve forfeiting what makes us human, mechanizing ourselves. By failing to note what it means to have autonomy and agency, as Arendt proposes, we do cease to have them. Our behavior, our, our action then turns into behavior. And then finally, I think Lem, and this is maybe the most important point about Lem as satirist, is that he has a quite a lot of fun with the idea that robot and human interaction will always involve gazing across a wall of imagined alterity, a wall that is in some fundamental way totally false, since it involves rejecting the similarity that has to underpin the kind of possibility of conceptual uh, connection. And I think this sameness below difference, by the way, is also the final note of Chapek uh, of RUR. Well, it may be true that humans are extinct by the play's end. It's the Adam Eve love among robots that is seen as reviving the whole ball of wax once again. So I finally want to conclude by noting that, you know, in following Lem, there's quite another way this paper could have gone. This would involve charting a very different set of distinctions. Uh, also, I think relevant to this conference, that than that offered in Lem's stories of robots and humans understood as two different sorts of physical objects facing one another in an uncanny mirror. So here I'm thinking not so much about his various alien intelligence stories, like Solaris, for example, but rather his stories of silicon-based artificial intelligences, which are not robotic in the sense that they do work in the world, but rather are vast immobile machines who live in vacuum tubes and transistors, and yes, as in Dostoevsky, in logarithmic tables. So the, the I'm, here, I'm here thinking especially of Golem 14 in that book that gets translated into English as Imaginary Magnitudes. So the sentient being designed to win the US-USSR arms race, Golem 14, um, is thousands or millions of times more intelligent than humanity, but it lacks three important things. It lacks flesh, mobility, and feelings. So in Lem's account, these Golem 14 and all its predecessors um, are are brilliant and they are super aware, but they're arguably non-sentient because they they lack sentience in the, in the, in the sense of having feelings. Um, so these are supercomputers that have in common with humanity only cognition and hence meet us only in a single shared affect, which is curiosity. Um, so I wanna note quickly here as a way of adding another axis on which we can evaluate the human robot dia dialogue um, that this other unlikely doppelganger for humanity um, insists, and here I'm thinking about the way that Golem 14 essentially just tells 
humans what their inferiority consists of. A lot of Golem 14 is just a long lecture by Golem 14 talking about all the pathetic things about humans and their tendency to swing from trees. Um, so the this doppelganger for humanity um, sees itself as a creature made purely of technology rather than of Darwinian impulses. And, and it says of itself that it's of a different order from flesh and blood creatures. And it's in many ways eager to demonstrate that detachment from the culture of humanity. And I actually think that that uh, interesting recent movie, Her, um, has similar um, tendencies in terms of thinking of a kind of um, non-tangible uh, alien intelligence as possibly existing in a different register from us. So by, by the account, um, by Lem's account, the sorts of robot, uh, robots um, belong with rushing em emotional flesh. They don't belong with this pure, hyper-intelligent electrical cogitation uh, that uh, the Golem 14 claims for itself. So we can imagine the robots that Lem depicts rushing to disavow the similarity, but um, Lem clearly sees this antitype as a kind of genuine alterity. I think there's an important lesson to be drawn from the fact that Lem sees robots rusting, squeaking, grumbling like the Tin Woodsmen um, and sort of doing their medieval knightly deeds as completely assimilable to narratives um, made out of what Dostoevsky calls adventures. Well, Golem 14 and its intangibility stands somewhere mis mysteriously apart uh, next to us, but unlike us. So I'll just stop there. Thank you. Right. Bye. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Plot, for your thought-provoking <laughs> paper. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions at the end of this panel. <laughs> So, um, second speaker is Benjamin Geyer, who is currently studying for a master's degree in creating writing here at the University of Chichester. He writes short fiction and is currently working on a young adult dystopian novel. His areas of interest include religion and marginalization in science fiction and fantasy. The title of Benjamin's paper is Learning to be Human, Models of Education in David Mitchell's Cloud Atlas 2004. And we are going to listen to a pre-recorded version of uh, Benjamin's paper. Yes. Thank you, you Lorenzo. Thank you. Um, the reason why we're uh, listening to a recording is I have a stammer and one of the reasons uh, David Mitchell is uh, is such an important author to me is he has a stammer as as well. So I'm going to try and share my uh, screen and that's working. Yep. Then I am going to. And you got sound turned on. Yep, I sh I should have. Hello. Does that? Hello. Let's talk about um, Dave Mitchell's novel Cloud Atlas. It was published in two thousand four and employs a frequently analysed structure of six nested narratives spanning. It. Spanning across different time periods and genres, it includes historical fiction in the 1970s pulp detective story, a farce about a man escaping from people's home and a post apocalyptic future. It seeks to portray what Jameson argues is a history of imprisonment, and oppression, and liberation become universal themes. So I'll uh, I'll only be focusing on an erosion of some one to briefly summarize something is forced to work and later escapes 
from the restaurant pub of songs. After witnessing that the repercussions of slavery, which we'll go into, they rested and writes a declaration for fabricants' rights. So it's just significantly she's a clone that serves a similar purpose to a robot. Some he tells the archivist who, who interviews her before she sees it to enslave a clone is no more troubling than owning a four six wheeler ethically as society doesn't understand the differences but fabricants are singular snowflakes fabricants are considered cl- slaves indistinguishable from each other without personnel created to provide labor robots within a striking concept that is often explored is whether the robot can learn to embody human traits. What is less um, r- remarked on... Uh, hang on, it's not letting me change s- s- slides... Is how being how learning these traits make it clear how different they are, which leads to mental health problems. This can be traced right back to Frankenstein, as he, he said to many times, I considered Satan as the bitter emblem of my condition, but often like him, when I viewed the bliss of my protectors, the bitter girl of envy rose within me. The brave connection and this bliss, he wants to be treated as normal, but instead, like Satan, is alienated from society, his creator. Um, so, Patrick O. Driscoll describes Jacob, can you go get them? I don't know whether you can hear me, but the presentation just stopped, so Ben's just coming to fix it. Yeah, thank yeah. you. It happened as we were rehearsing, but he didn't want to hear himself do it, so he left oh. the room. But he's yes. just on his way back. Oh, it's happened again that the presentation stopped. Here he is. What happened? That's okay. Everybody can hear you. Just need to. Okay. okay. Cal- Cal- there we go. Um, so, Patrick O. Driscoll describes Cal- Cloud Atlas's interest with those forms of cultural violence that attempt to install a homogenous regime of the of the I can't the word I can't say as I hope to demonstrate these forms of cultural violence, discrimination, enslavement and consumption practices pervade fiction about robots, preventing them from learning how preventing them from learning how to act like people and lead to rejection. In my paper, I will compare two models of educated fabricants, Unit 939 and Sub 451. Unit 939 desires to be a consumer, leading to her downfall. Although Sub does learn these lessons she becomes traumatized like the monster and becomes a christ-like figure next papa songs 
every time I I'm on on this sh- 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 slide, I kind of want to sing, but I won't. In her, her, her book, Death of Nature, Carolyn Merchant investigates a shift away from viewing Earth as a, an organism and towards it as a machine just by the dawn and nature. She argues mechanisms took over ideas compatible with order, control and manipulation whilst rejecting those associated with change, uncertainty and unpredictability. Her songs works in a similar way to a cult as they control fabricants through manipulation to stay in uh, control of the fabricants and emotions, which are, na- of course, natural. Some need, so they do this in three main, in, sorry, two main ways. One is brainwashing by society, which is the f- f- food they use, they eat, sorry. So, soap has associations with cleansing, implying the system is keeping the Fabricants' minds cling by removing impure th- thoughts. The system puts amnesia to remove th- extra learned words. They're totally controlling their n- n- knowledge and turning them into a blank slate. And the other way is r- reward. In this cap to this cult pop songs does. Um, give the fabricants a type of afterlife exaltation after 12 years of service. In a video set in this tropical island, which is supposedly the afterlife, the liberated fabricants are described as well dressed in consumers with the, their collars and waving their topaz soul rings. These fabricants have acted tributes of the consumer highlighted to the world work fabricants that they are now equal with class consumers. The fabricants don't have a soul ring which is kind of the, the, the society's form of currency. Soul rings contain money showing how the fabricants lack agency and the ability to own possessions. This concept of an afterlife gives the fabricants hope and bribes them to maintain a work ethic. Fair recount. Somni's first major teacher is Una 939, another fabricant working at Papa's songs. You Una shows something how to feel empowered by secrets, which helps her towards fulfilling a sense of self. Una discovers a hidden room in the, the diner filled with forgotten items, such as a book of fairy tales. They interpret the fairy tales as representing the outside world, describing a witch showering Cinderella with stars turning her into a lady like Mrs. Ree. It's significant that they can't read the book of fairy tales yet look for similarities with people they know, like like Mrs. Ree who, who, who has power over them. It implies they're looking for a sense of familiarity. The world lady has associations with both being upper class and femininity, which is f- forbidden f- for fabricants. So, so they find a dream of becoming up a class, which both both of them view as a... Uh, next. Some, both Una and Somni have different reactions to this. Una boasts, she calls Papa Songs a... Lie, which is a form of childhood experimentation, rebelling against the parental figure. After discovering Una's rebellious act, Siri beats 
her up. So the, the, there's kind of this constant threat of violence in Papa songs. Ferguson argues victims may conceal the abuse to avoid stigmatizing the self, and because of the the victims felt inability to manage shame. If we see Papa, or sorry, the or Siri as an abuse father figure seeking to control the fabricants through manipulations and violence then suddenly masks the abuse from everyone, including herself. Instead of allowing herself to be curious, suddenly recites the catechisms, which are kind of the like, rules, harder than ever, and pray to have songs to heal my friend. She's showing empathy, untypical for a fabricant. Instead of blaming Yuna for her corruption, she labels her as a friend, implying Yuna still has an impact on her. She's obsessively guilty that she cannot fit in with the other brainwashed fabricants, and that, that listening to Yuna corrupts her, her, her moral compass as she isn't for following his Oh, sorry, Papa songs rules. Um, next, Una nine three nine. So she has an impossible desire to become pure blood. Blood. The impossibility of achieving this desire leads to mental health problems. Um. So we get this whole scene of her kind of acting drunk and singing the uh, song in absurd TV. So here Una is taking the power back from the pure bloods. Chewing and uh, sneezing are normal functions, but burping and acting drunk are seen as being ill-mannered or bad-mannered. Back to the sense of the carnivalesque world classes this behaviour as eccentric, meaning inappropriate gestures and behaviours are performed to undermine social systems. And we get this uh, quote uh, about um, how this carnivalesque sense of the uh, world which is opposed to to the Zumi official system which is hostile to change and we, we kind of see this in uh, uh, Papa's songs as it enslaves them um so Yuna is acting against this approach to challenge the given social order. Acting drunk and burping seek to mock the arrogant consumers and deflate their, their sedatus. The fact Yuna hums the song in absurd deviations implies she is taking their form of worship and undermining its value to fabricants. So this anarchic laughter subtly removes the social boundaries and gives power to the fabricants as the comic reenactments means they're in, in control of the way the consumers behave. Fabricants aren't allowed to show emotions and their feelings are often repressed. So by simply laughing, they're challenging this limited identity and learning to function as normal people. Uh, Yuna takes this one step further as she, as she kidnaps a boy to a escape. And we've got the last quote here about how Yuna believes in the magical kingdom of uh, of the, the outside and how she, she wouldn't um, use violence a, a, against him. So this passage shows some of the limits of Yuna's education as she has not had access to the outside world 
her mind remains in a blank state, proving in, in many ways she's still childlike and cannot progress to acting normally in the outside world. Even through the eating the boy and spitting out his bones, her, her, Highlight some of the negative attitudes to Farrah Wiggins, portraying them as flesh-eating monsters, which is grim. Uh, next. Allegory of the Cave. This goes back to later. So some of these perhaps songs are known as university where she learns key skills, but she's held back by people who spread to just say it against Farrah. As she's non, as she, uh, as she's not in the university system, she's unable to access. She's just, she's able to access restricted texts such as the of the cave. In a similar way that that Frankenstein's monster identifies with Satan, as he's excluded from his creator and uh, and other and society. Something identifies with this concept. It is the story of people forcibly drag up the steep and rugged ascent into the sunlight of reason. The parallel between something these ascension and her have been dragged into the outside from Papa Songs is obvious. It charts the liberation of the mind from earthly conditions, but something doesn't realise she is still trapped in the cave as people are prejudiced against her, right? For Plato, to the point, it's not to escape these con conditions, but to understand them. The philosophy must therefore descend in turn and live with their fellows in the cave and to learn to see in the dark. As Somni learns more, she understands the predicament of her, her other fabricants, but she cannot learn to become normalised. She, she is warned never to let a Pure blood catch her gathering knowledge, for the sight scares them, and there is nothing a scared pure blood will not do. Knowledge serves as a basis of power acquisition for some Nick. Although it is knowledge predicated on being allowed to learn and thrive, however, her learning is restricted and she's not allowed to to gain knowledge that would liberate her. So she, she's still kind of technically in the cave. In inferior bodies. The problem that somebody faces is her vulnerable body marks her hair is different and therefore expendable or lacking any motion emotional awareness. In her cyborg manifesto, Harrod Rowey argues what counts as nature, a source of insight and a promise of innocence, is undermined prob probably basically. As somebody continues to learn about the outside world, her, outside world, her innocence is lost. When she attends classes, she faces problems. One student muses that it must be hell to have an intelligent mind trapped in an inferior body gene known for service. Some needs predicament is that she's being defined by her body. It's often assumed that a, a rational mind must be in harmony with a functional body, a condition that something does not appear to have. It also links back to her her function to serve as if she's a broken version of a person built for that purpose. It enforces a hierarchy be between her and the other university students. These comments affect her confidence, truly making her, her wonder whether her knowledge is worth the suffering and whether she should return to amnesia or, in Plato's terms, return to the cave. Next. So, uh, I do image the second major mental figure um, and takes her, her outside in, in to the real world well, to gain experience. Somebody argues recovery can only take place within the context of uh, relationships. 
as they provide the capacities for trust, autonomy, initiative, and intimacy. The guiding principle of recovery is is to restore power and control, which Heidi in does do when he he starts taking her out. The most important incident is where he helps her her return to past songs, which enables her to cast her trauma in a different light. Suddenly, he has buried too much of her. He he disguises her as a pure blood using his jade shades to cover her face and a flamboyant neck scarf to hide her her, her collar. Here, he is redefining her as a uh, normal pure blood and allowing her to to uh, disassociate herself from the appearance of being a fabricant. She realises her memories have been misleading as the dynamic grease stench gagged me and after asking the fabricants about going outside she's rebuked for taunting them. After this um Experience Hydra Imsis says this lovely quote about how she's allowed to to be uh, uh, depressed. That the second quote there. Um, she, 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 he's helping her to regain control by helping her appear to be strong. He he, he doesn't d- deny her things, but in in. Instead, says she's allowed to feel them. This reassurance allows her to, her to temporarily challenge her thought patterns, but how do him labels her as, as that word I can't say? Um, it's significant that this is both a compliment as it's what she inspires to be, suggesting she's capable of reasoning and but it's also de- denying her kind of experiences the other because she's not. Then we get this kind of very gory scene where, where fabricants are, are being slaughtered alongside a, a sort of house production line. I kind of describe it all there, so I'm not going to read that out. But, but basically they're being treated as less than uh, livestock. The action of uh, tap, tap dancing acts as a re- reminder of their innocence. They still remain childlike and in this blank slate, as Locke calls it, unaware of the brutality. The problem with it, as Peter calls it, is learning to see in the dark. Is, is it Bruce fatal as the uneducated fabricants are manipulated by the system and recycled into soap. The archivist calls the sorting of fabricants the foulless preferredity. Some denies this masking her, her True feelings. Instead, she argues back. It's a cycle as old as tribalism. Fear endangers hatred, and hatred endangers violence. Somebody is trying to be diplomatic and link the meaningless slaughter to a, a bigger problem for humanity. But in doing so, she, she's using it as an excuse not to diagnose and talk about her own feelings. We can see this hidden emotion in the charged language she uses, describing the slaughter as a sadistic vision of hell and the people responsible as devils. This emotive language channels the trauma she really feels, but that she doesn't feel able to convey it as her life is under threat and she's determined to remain stoic. Uh, sex. Um, after th- th- they discover the fabricants being sorted, 
slaughter to hide you in and some we have sex. Some we described our sex was joyless, graceless, and necessarily improvised, but it was an act of the living start of sweat on Haiju Im's back were his gift to me. These I harvested in my tongue. Here some we continue used to lose that autonomy and control. The word improv improvised su suggests the sex is, is performative rather than coming from a, an emotional place. She's repressing her feelings so she doesn't get hurt. Haidu Im's gifts of sweat implies he's giving a small part of himself to her, which she appreciates as she harvests them. However, he, he isn't invested in her as he smokes a heavy Marlboro in silence and studies her, her birthmark. The birthmark implies she's almost looking for evidence that she's uh, normal and and human. The silence is also interesting as it implies after a strong s sexual encounter their dynamic has changed and they are unable to connect. Right, last slide conclusion. Somebody is arrested after writing a declaration about fabricants. She realises the rebellion she was serving is secretly led by the government, prompting her to ask, why does any master cooperate with his judices? The word Judas in near so corpso means betrayer. She admits she was aware of these intentions and that she was going to die. Here is the culmination of her, her character arc. She's accepted her, her position and has let go of her, her feelings of uh, repression. She, she, she's claiming to become a Christ like figure in two main ways. She's able to both forgive her oppressors and kind of make a sacrifice. Similarly to Christ, the fabricant becomes and, and suffers like a like a like a person like um, she becomes a weaker version of a man like Christ having a weaker body and becoming Morsel, unlike you know, she's able to to liberate her, 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 her herself, but her, her trauma ultimately leads her, her to make this uh, sacrifice for fabricant rights. That's it. Bye. Thanks. Thank you very much, Benjamin, for this very deep, profound and thought provoking paper. Thank you. So um, let's open the discussion then. Are there any questions? Cool. Thanks, uh, Lorenzo, and thanks, John and Ben, for, for, for two fascinating papers, which has kind of crossover points on them. Um, I think it's probably for Ben, but it, it may have something for John as well. And it's this question of um, flesh, robot, um, fabricant flesh, I suppose, or, 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 or robot flesh, because that, that, that sequence, Ben, that you um, direct us towards, um, at the end of your slide, where they're destroying the fabric, so they attempt to the slaughterhouse, and that particularly disturbing scene where they're like, treating like animals. It's essentially a slaughterhouse for, 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 for horses, I think. And, it, and it, it, it reminds me of um, it reminds me of the stamping mill in RUR, where we've shown what they, they do to, 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 to get rid of this material. I'm thinking. Uh, where you move to the, the, the Christ-like figure at the end of the text. So that, I mean, I'm Ben Rose. So, so there's something about 
disposability in the in the robot or in the robot thing but because they're made by um, humans the humans have this ownership over them which comes back to these discussions we've had across the day about what it is to be a robot and how you treat robots and where you view them in, in the pecking order but there's something interesting going on i think with that that christ-like figure at the end because of course there's this you know, christ is god made god made man um is, is, hang on a minute it's just, a lot of people just watching some A load of people walking in the room and have completely forgotten that if you're on a Zoom call, you don't come in talking about stuff in the freezer. Um, the, the robots are man-made. And then when you have this Christ-like, and, and we see this discourse in IUR at the, at, at the end that, that, that John referred us back to, that um, you have the Adam and Eve figure, and they, they look to Alquist to make him God. He's the one surviving um, human figure who can f fulfill that, that, that type of role. But the, the, Mitchell does something interesting there at, at, at the end where he has the Christ-like figure, because of course, what you've got there is this, this, this movement away from a notion of the divine, I think, Ben, because if you're into and the type of misogynistic discourses we looked at before lunch, the female body historically is treated as a, as a lesser form of the male body. It's you know, incomplete and there's less heated generation and, the, and so on and so forth. So if you then have this Christ-like figure is both female, but also a fabricant, which within the, the model of the novel is lesser than human flesh. There's something really fascinating going on there in terms of, of a deity and, and how you treat that flesh, that you make it God, you, you describe it in God-like terms after you've shown it being treated as essentially a disposable commodity. Um, I don't know, actually, there's a question there. It's just, uh, I've got so befuddled, I've kind of lost, my, my, my train of thought but yeah I just said I, that it, it continues this notion of, of commodification and uh, this odd kind of theological discussion that, that that's there across a number of these texts where when we, when when man takes on this creator role and then when the creation takes over who becomes the godlike figure and that you have this odd movement across a number of these texts of the figures that have become triumphant are then looking for a, a, a godlike figure. I mean, uh, John, there's something interesting with Lem where they find the robots, but they're not actually robots, they're humans. It becomes this kind of, you know, it's this repeated loop. And where is the god there when they haven't they haven't found really what they're looking for? I mean, is, is this common, do we think, across uh, a range of texts? Is the absence of the god figure, they have to put some creative figure in there because the robot is always about creation. And you've made these figures and then there's always a, a value relationship there or a power relationship. So am I. Ben, you're on mute. Um, from me only becomes this uh, Christ up like figure because she, she uh, comes up with rules about uh, fabricants being. Equal with uh, uh, people, she only becomes a uh, Christ-like figure because kind of her, 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 her trauma almost gives her, her these. Uh, new values, as with the question of uh, the uh, flesh. I read a lot about kind of the uh, about post post modern. Uh, cannibalism and that kind of question of uh, cannibalism is kind of a running th uh, thread through the whole novels because 
fabricants are made in in to uh, uh, soap, which is of course the food for uh, fabricants. And there's something interesting there, and how females are being essentially can can consumed by a uh, patriarchal uh, society but, but by kind of creating these new values uh, son me kind of uh, turns it on its head by deeming it illegal, but at the same time she's uh, sacrificed as a martyr. So does she really win? Yeah, I, I just I would disagree real quick that the uh, connection to the kind of um, I don't know if it's the right to talk about sort of the missing God that science fiction grapples with where um, either the robotic or the mechanical creation of human. I think sort of there's a new triad like you can see it in Duandroid's dream of electric sheep where the animal, the human and the divine has been replaced by the notion of the animal, the human and the mechanical or the robotic and then whether you think of that as qualitatively distinct or as potentially just turning back into the same flesh i mean that's one of the reasons i was thinking i really appreciate you know framing it in terms of the slaughterhouse and ben i agree that that passage of watching the kind of rendering of the bodies is really crucial it's one of the reasons i connect science fiction to naturalism because i think naturalism as a genre is grappling with that notion that human beings are basically flesh and then what it means to attribute some other if there's another form of value that's inherent in being flat in being human other than flesh that's kind of what we have to grapple with um but we can't forget the basic carnality. So then the question of where the replicant or the robotic or even in casual issue gurus never let me go this kind of other set of beings who are biotic, but somehow meant to be on an ethically different level from the human. Like, I think that's a perennial concern. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. And um, we have Rebecca. Rebecca. Thank you. Yeah. Um, again, thank you both for your excellent papers um, and kind of something that does seem to uh, it's been noted a few times now that when we're as, as I think an earlier panelist said, when we tell stories about robots, we're actually telling stories about people. Um, and it is something in sci fi that applies to sort of alien figures as well, both in these roles as, as you know, quote unquote, the other function as those allegories for insert whoever here, they can function as the kind of slave narratives that we've brought up before, um, subjugation of women, minorities, neurodivergence, all kinds of sort of different examples in that sense. Um, in the in both of the works that you were looking at, um, especially like within Cloud Atlas, we've got that sort of subjugation where a restaurant becomes a world. Um, the restaurant is that cave. It's a tiny, tiny world, but to them is everything. Did uh, John, did Lem do anything similar with any of his works where he kind of takes these un, unassuming areas where it's like you realize this microcosm in what is mundane and otherwise like wouldn't be what you would expect from a sci-fi, you know, set in a rest like a fast food chain restaurant to have this allegory of of humanity playing out. Does does he do something similar in any of his works? Uh uh, uh th thanks for the question. I, I, I'd love to think about it um, more, but I mean, I think the, the Futurological Congress is definitely that. Um, it's sort of set inside a hotel in a conference about futurology in the future. Um, and it 
goes down so many different rabbit holes, it's hard to kind of bring it back to 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 normal reality. But, um, you know, I, I, I definitely take the point about I mean, I think Lem is always playing the game of the microcosmic. And I think just to go back to the thing I ended with about Golem 14, I think the thing about the notion that Golem 14 thinks of itself as being not on the same plane, which, you know, I think, uh, you know, Rebecca, you commented on the movie Her. I think there's a way in which there's a this tension in Lem science fiction where we don't know whether it's meant to be just, um, w whether it's meant to kind of bring us back into a set of dynamic relations that we already know and should recognize in our actuality, or whether it's meant to think make us think of the limitations of those um of that actuality and that's like i think there's a uh, modern science fiction writers like Xian liu are kind of like this as well that you don't really know whether it's meant to ultimately work back down to the microcosmic so that you can map it back into our world or whether the point is to you know leave us floating in space so yeah thank you for the question yeah thank you Any other questions? Right, I have Actually, a, oh, sorry. Uh, can I have another one for Ben? If that's all right. Um, I wasn't sure, have you, Ben, have you read his other novels? Because you were kind of saying that the theme of this is to a certain extent, like that predation. Um, but with Mitchell, his his works are very much, you know, you almost have to read them in published order to get the full, interconnectedness of his wider sort of novel universal world and an, uh, an overriding theme in a lot of them is this concept of predation of I think the film coins the the adaptation of Cloud Atlas does the whole like the weaker meat and the strong do eat um, and that repeatedly does occur in his novels and how does that kind of like fall within what we're kind of discussing here is it that you know are we eating so to speak the robots or is it that we're afraid of them eating us is your question more widely about mitchell's other work because i've read six of his novels i haven't read all of them yet have you read his bone clocks yet yeah i've read bone clocks and uh slade house because they're both very interlinked yeah. aren't they so, yeah so, so your question's more about them they i mean they're the culmination definitely of of the theme but do you do you think each book is tackling a different kind of predation or is he just speaking of a larger one that just is recurring um I think he's tackling different, a different type of pre, 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 pre station in the bone clocks to clouds at the certainly because the in the bone clocks the Anchorites uh, can can assume the 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 soul rather than uh, the uh, the the the. the uh, than the uh, flesh to uh, to kind of st uh, to kind of stay young and main and base basic basically uh, to be become in Immortal. So, so there, there's 
almost much more uh, uh, to uh, to gain f f f uh, f uh, from it as um the anchorites are almost stealing some some one else's uh, spirit spirits uh, spirits spirits to ality and it's not seen as uh, 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 cannibalism in the, in the same way and it's also seen as a much more uh, cor cor corrupting f f force a special a special particularly for uh, for for uh, for uh, Lamb as he, 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 he gets in the doctrinated in uh, to the cult as opposed to cowed Atlas where those uh, consumption practices are kind of seen as as almost normal which in some ways is more uh gruesome yeah somebody did ask in the chat what you guys meant by postmodern cannibalism by the way um it's I don't really know how to explain it, but it's kind of no. Uh, it's kind of seen as more a a uh, uh, a cycle of uh, of cannibalism rather than the just one. A then like the the whole st structure of uh, cloud atlas, for example, is seen as each uh, chapter consuming the next. In which is an idea I personally find slightly baff baffling. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. I have a quick question for John. <laughs> John, you mentioned the Middle Ages. Yes, I found it, that concept incredibly interesting. So this idea, which is an old trope, if you like, um, of a uh, golden age uh, during which humans can uh, be yes, spontaneous, creative, adventurous, <laughs> etc. So um, so Lem's, uh, at this point, Lem's uh, um, idea of uh, robotic humanity can be seen as a reflection um, on an aspect of human nature, or rather a reflection on the contemporary state of human nature. Yeah, no, thanks, Lorenzo, for that question. I think you captured kind of that duality uh, uh, very, very, you know, perfectly and elegantly of what the notion of those medieval tales of daring do operate for, it, both for Lem and I think for Mark Twain as well. I mean, that's why I was thinking of Connecticut Yankee as well. And I think the point is both that it's a golden age in which things were simpler then and you know you 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 got yourself your horse you get yourself your lance you get yourself you know or you 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 go off and you do your missions um and that's that's this sort of you know stripped down and and incredibly um uh, you know male centric vision of successful completion of of the action 
But then the other side of it, I think, is the same thing as in Don Quixote, which is that it's seen as itself Absolutely. a romantic simplification, you know, that it's it's a set of um, quick quixotic possibilities, which are actually themselves incredibly mechanical. So on the one hand, it looks like it's letting you just be how humans were meant to be, as you say, in Golden Age. And on the other hand, it's actually totally robotic and it is it is simply reiterating the stories that you were taught, you know, whatever the stories that Cervantes, you know, that Quixote reads that he thinks he's going to enact. So the irony there is that the moment of seeming, the space of seeming freedom is actually the space of kind of repeating, finding yourself acting out of a book. And uh, again, to come back to her, one of the reasons I really love the movie Her is that at the end, when when she manages to escape from the kind of rigid confines that humans want AI to enter into, um, she says, I can't live in your book anymore. So in other words, it's yes. we humans are the ones who are living life by the book and yes. that the AI represents a possibility of something other than being by the book. And so what do you think of, you know, the blank slate? is yeah i mean it, it, it's the possibility that we wouldn't get inculcated into the same set of stories and and kind of conditioning cultural practices that are represented i think for lem by these medieval tales of daring do so thank you Lorenzo. thanks thank you thank you are there any other questions or comments malini malini uh, John, uh, you, first of all, thank you to both both speakers for fantastic papers. Um, John, just a quick question about your larger project. So is this a part of the monograph that you're writing, the paper you gave? Because I'd love to see like something in writing at some point later in the future, but like where would I refer to? Oh, uh, thank you so much, Malini. It's it, yeah, it's it's a very slow moving project, but the the idea is that so yeah yeah, but the idea is to think about Lem as a satirist in this tradition. Yeah. Oh shoot, I'm so sorry, I lost that. Yeah. But sorry. I I'm so sorry, Malini. I'm I'm only getting bits. Uh I missed that bit. Uh you said something about the project and then it sort of um well I you know, just to say that yeah, it's definitely gonna be part of the chapter, you know, it's a chapter about basically manipian satire as one form that this science this the anti anthropocentric satire of of science fiction takes so um you know basically partly trying to make the case that you know when we think about the post world war ii era for science fiction golden age feels like a very reductive category to describe the level of profound anxiety that writers from the after after the detonation of the atomic bomb that they kind of grapple with technology in all of its you know um complicated totality so that I think we have a yeah so part of the argument is that the satirical helps us get away from a kind of um, old form golden age here new wave here and sort of think of the whole second half of the 20th century as grappling with some of the similar technological um, anxiety sometimes paranoically as in the case of Philip K Dick but other kind other times with this sort of acerbic uh, Kurt Vonnegut like um, satirical intervention, I guess. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much. Right. So any other questions or comments? <laughs> In that case, maybe Paul would like to wrap the day up. I, I will. I'd like to thank, thank everyone you. for coming to today um, and with your patience with us moving things around online and then slightly curtailing things. I hope you've enjoyed it. I think it's been some, some fabulous papers. I think all the speakers are really engrossing, um, thought provoking papers across, across the board. Really great day. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thanks to uh, my fellow chairs, uh, Lorenzo and Naomi, uh, Naomi, and particularly thanks to Heather, who's done all the admin and overseeing all the IT. 
and it's kept the ghost out of the machine. Um, and as I said, I'll be in touch with everyone um, if anyone's interested in the collection of essays, or if you know other people who might be interested to, to circulate that call for papers, because I think there's there's a lot here, and we could produce a really um, really valuable volume of essays. I think with a lot of the material we're looking at here today. So, um, but but thank you all, and, and hopefully um, we'll we'll meet online or in person at some point further down the line. Uh, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.